Imagine the surprise of classical historians in the 1870s to discover that the ancient city of Troy was real. Before then, everyone assumed it was as mythical and non-existent as Atlantis, just a story dreamt up by that Homer guy as an object lesson about the perils of spousal kidnapping. But what do you know when an archaeologist wanders around the western coast of Anatolia and starts digging roughly where Homer said the city was, one might happen to discover a Troy or two, or in this case, nine, as Mr. Heinrich Schliemann found nine distinct layers of urban settlement, stretching back from the late stone Age into the Bronze Age and down through the Roman Empire. That same decade, Schliemann applied this winning strategy on the Greek mainland to find the home of King Agamemnon and, of course, take all his stuff. Not that he was still using it, nor deserved to keep it, but motives aside, sure enough, Homer's descriptions led to the fabled site of Mykene rich in gold, whereupon Heinrich discovered a metric ass ton of golden treasures and artifacts. Among them, a solid gold death mask that Schliemann oh so dramatically insisted was Agamemnon's, which is like digging up a Guy Fox mask and proclaiming that's American icon George Washington because who else would it be? But this is also the same eccentric gentleman who swiftly developed a reputation for peppering his dig sites with outside relics and straight-up forgeries to tie his findings to the Homeric heroes. In spite of his shifty habits, it turns out the findings were far more consequential than just a face mask of the suckiest character in the epic cycle. Because modern archaeology dates the treasure trove to 1600 BC, four centuries before the supposed time of the Trojan War. And when taking the discoveries at Troy and Mykene together, we find out that there was a broad, long-lasting, and robust Bronze Age civilization in the Aegean a full millennium before Greece's classical period. So, to find out what this Mycenaean civilization was like, and understand why it disappeared, let's do some history. As with all sufficiently ancient civilizations, Mycenaean origins are murky and unknowable, but as best we can guess, some Indo-Europeans crossed over from Anatolia into the Greek peninsula sometime around 2000 BC and either joined or subjugated the native population, and the lasting outcome of that collision was an early form of the Greek language. Granted, it took this shiny new civilization a while to get going, as we don't see the society come into full form until the mid-millennium when Schliemann's beloved palace cities start popping up by the hundreds, from the Peloponnese to Thessaly. The 1500s BC also see the construction of bling-filled shaft tombs and grave circles right outside the cities. Echoing the Egyptians, albeit on a much smaller scale, the Mycenaeans made a point to bury their VIPs with truly obscene amounts of wealth. Weapons, precious stones from Far East, and goldwork in a distinctly Minoan style. So while this directly shows how the Mycenaeans were active participants in the expansive Mediterranean trade networks of the time, their aesthetic choices might also indicate a power dynamic with the mysterious Minoan civilization from the island of Crete. Now, unlike the mainlanders, the Minoans did not speak Greek, and as a result we have only the loosest, most disappointingly flimsy grasp on their culture. But they had a killer aesthetic, and the Mycenaeans didn't need a translator to figure that out, so the mainland Greek palaces took heavy influence from their Cretan neighbors, in their pottery, their mural work, and in their architecture. Because much as the labyrinthine palaces of Crete served functions from administration to religion to manufacturing, commerce, and food storage, the mainland palaces were similarly designed to handle all these tasks. This Minoan influence kept up all throughout the Bronze Age, but the Mycenaean palaces had a distinct character to them because of a little thing called monarchy. This is first evident in the elaborate burials of the 16 and 1500s BC, where only someone of such singular importance could justify throwing all that wealth in the ground. And we don't see that on Crete. And the Mycenaean concept of royalty is confirmed by the word wanox appearing in Mycenaean ledgers, which is what Homer calls the Achaean kings. Then, when the palaces really take shape two centuries later, their central feature is a megaron, a cozy throne room with splendid frescoes all around and a giant hearth in the center, along with huge banquet rooms like we hear about from Homer, channeling that Minoan grandeur on a much more compact scale. The palaces topped out at a hundred rooms max, and the Greek mainland had so many of them that it seems each Mycenaean king had a little pocket-sized realm to call their own. The palace of Nestor at Pylos was one of many Mycenaean sites nestled among the mountains of the mainland, looking out over a valley and down toward the sea. Most Mycenaean kings only ruled what was in line of sight, making them much smaller fish than the Minoan palace of Knossos, which seemed to rule the entire island of Crete. As we'll see throughout Greek history, the land is so thick with mountains that any one city will naturally struggle to hold power across a long distance. So smaller domains per kingdom make sense when the geography itself is figuratively and literally balkanized. And this might go a ways to explaining why the Mycenaeans were so frantically militaristic. Their art is all about hunting and warfare, they buried kings with prized weapons, and kept huge armories in their palaces. So whether they were constantly fighting each other for gold, or taking their talents to the mercenary business for the Minoans, there's clearly more to this than empty mod 
macho vibes, because the Mycenaeans perceived enough of a threat lurking behind the hills and off the coast to take some drastic measures. By the 1200s BC, the terrain and their military must have stopped being sufficient for protection because major cities surrounded themselves with truly colossal walls of giant stones stacked up over 50 feet high and sometimes nearly as thick. Later, Greeks attributed these massive fortifications to the giant Cyclopes, but terrified humans could also do the job in a pinch. Whatever it was that got them so spooked, it was so bad that Mykene and nearby Tyrans took the extra step of fortifying the cisterns, presumably to ensure their water supplies could withstand a siege. Inconsiderate neighbors, I tell you, they play music until 3 a.m., they steal the buried treasures of your ancestral kings, and they poison your water supply. So selfish. That said, the builders at Mikine weren't too busy quaking with terror at the unknown to show off a little, and took the Cyclopean walls as an opportunity to flex with the centerpiece Lion Gate leading into the city, featuring a giant heraldic sculpture that would have been completely unmatched in the Aegean. Yet, the broader trend was much the same as it had been earlier, with most of the fancy new construction going to use underground, as dozens of cities built beehive-shaped Tholos tombs for their last few generations of kings. So we've got a steady embellishment of mainland cities right alongside increasingly dangerous neighbors, and the Mycenaeans were right to be wary of each other, because Greeks had a habit of destroying civilizations. See, back a century and a half in the mid-1400s BC, the Minoan palaces on Crete got slammed into the Shadow Realm so hard that their entire society spontaneously disintegrated. A rough way to start the week. But the exception was the main palace at Knossos, which stayed in use for one more century and conveniently left us some written records before its abandonment. The tablets used the same linear A script the Minoans used for centuries, but now recorded the Mycenaean spoken language of Greek. Before long, this linear B was found on tablets all across the mainland, implying that, one way or another, Crete had been destroyed and the Mycenaean Greeks were gleefully benefiting from it. A most curious coincidence. This century after the Cretan conquest and before the Cyclopean fortifications saw the Greeks hit their stride by drawing on Cretan writing, visual aesthetics, and palace structure, ultimately resembling the deadified Minoans here in the 1300s more than they ever had before. And it's from their adoption of Cretan writing that we get a glimpse of Mycenaean religion. While most of the clay tablets left behind are warehouse logs, armory tallies, and other admin stuff, we can clearly spot some familiar names, like Poseidao, Atana, Ade, and Diwonuso. The gang's not all here yet, no Aphrodite or Hades to speak of, but we can see nearly all 12 Olympians even this far back. One oddball quirk here is that it seems Poseidon was the big boy deity, not just at sea, but also on land and possibly in the underworld, since Hades had no known mentions at this point and likely came later. Very weird, very cool, and while I am definitely not the myth, guy, we can use these stories we know to clarify one particularly pesky part of the history the collapse. Records left by the Hittites and Egyptians in the 13 and 1200s mention the great kings of Ahiyawa, referring to the lands of Achaea where the Mycenaeans lived. But just two centuries later, the Hittites were gone, the Egyptians were struggling, and Greek writing was forgotten after all those fortified Mycenaean palaces were abandoned. Alright gang, get your conspiracy boards, because theories to explain this bizarrely widespread cross-Mediterranean collapse range from climate change to internal upheaval to earthquakes to inter-palace warfare, but we've seen busted palaces get a makeover and stay in use post-collapse, that's why Troy has nine layers, so the question is not so much why they died, but why they stayed dead, and this is where the myths might help us. For example, the sudden death of Minoan Crete could be adequately explained by invasion, but we can pull a far more compelling thread by considering how the myth of the Minotaur fits in, as spoils of Minoan piracy taken to a maze-like palace with bull aesthetics becomes ritual sacrifice to the monster in the labyrinth, and an Athenian hero's daring victory in Crete reflects the actual Mycenaean conquest conquest of the island. Likewise, the Mycenaeans' rabid militarism and massive fortifications on their palaces would be costly to maintain, indicating that whatever threat they were facing had them so scared the cost didn't matter to them. And archaeology shows that Troy was a large, wealthy city between the Greek and Hittite worlds, guarding the trade routes into the Black Sea. If resources got scarce because of drought or famine somewhere, or if new trade routes bypassed Greece, or there was too much piracy for goods to flow, or just because the Mycenaeans spent all their cash on walls and weapons, competition in the already militant Mycenaean civilization would intensify, and Troy, with its favorable location and vast wealth, would surely be a coveted prize. But even a mild disruption to the city, let alone a sack, would wildly destabilize the regional trade that kept Bronze Age societies running. Aha! Uh -huh. We're getting somewhere. Now, 
Looking at the Greeks' own tale of the Trojan War and peeling off the mythical embellishments, we see a giant conflict that ended in the total sacking of Troy and the deaths of several Greek hero kings. Realistic explanations of the Trojan War play up the angle of a fight over trade routes, but taken all together, we get something like piracy against the single richest city in the Aegean world at a time when the flows of wealth that supported a massive warrior class were rapidly drying up, resulting in the martial power of the Mycenaean warrior elite spending its last dying effort on trying to conquer Troy in the hopes that their pirated wealth would stave off the collapse of their civilization. But failing. Because sure, Troy gets got, but look what happens after. Very few heroes make it home back alive, and Odysseus had to fight off hordes of suitors once he finally did a decade later. All the Trojan gold in the world won't help if every palace is in a succession crisis. So it's possible the epic stories retold over centuries are the distant, imprecise memories of a doomed military expedition to Troy, and the potential cause of a mass power vacuum that leads to the chaos we see in the archaeological record. First, the more vulnerable palace start falling in the 1200s, then Troy has a burn lair at 1180 BC, Pelos is burned that same year, and just a couple years later, Egypt's pharaoh Ramses III has to fight off these suspiciously Greek-sounding Equesh and Denyens sailing down from the north. This indicates a broad migration of Greeks and others fleeing the wreckage of the Aegean for safer ground, resulting in oddities like Peloponnesian Greek spoken in Cyprus and Mycenaean pottery in Palestine. Whatever happened in the 1200s to set things in motion, Troy was the tipping point of a widespread collapse of Bronze Age civilization. <laughs> Whoops. And that is roughly how the Mycenaean Greeks turned on themselves and took down everybody along with them, leaving Greece without writing or large urban centers for centuries after, but with one hell of a story about the time they destroyed the fucking world. Thank you for watching. After investigating the history of the Minoans, it's great to see that Greek civilization in Achaea started right out the gate as an absolute disaster. Supremely on brand. Excellent work all around. With our Bronze Age preamble complete, we can dig into the history of classical Greece in future videos down the line, so I'll see you then.